Unicart Game in Unity is one of the easiest ways to get started with netcode for game objects. Today we're going to lay the foundation for an exciting multiplayer kart game by creating a kart controller that includes custom logic for drifting and quick acceleration and sharp turns. So fasten your seatbelts, let's build a kart for our coding adventure. Alright, I'm just going to walk through some setup really quickly. In project settings under player, I've set a company name and a product name. And if we head over to the editor and scroll down a little bit, I've enabled enter play mode options, but disabled the two checkboxes underneath that for reloading the domain. Root namespace, let's put something in here. I'm just going to call mine cart. And then let's jump over to the package manager. We need three packages to get this episode running. The first one is Cinemachine. So I've already got mine in my project, but I'll just show you here what version it is. And also we need Pro Builder and we need the new Unity input system. Bring this one in last because it's gonna force you to restart your editor. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's uh, create a little ground plane for ourselves here. I'm gonna make it quite big, about thousand by a thousand. That's just something for us to drive on in the beginning here. Now, I've imported a bunch of models from Open Game Art already, and they come in a few different file formats, one of which the most useful for us is the Blender format. I'll leave a link in the description to these models and several other options for models and racetracks. Now, if we have a look at it here, I'll drag one card into the project. You can see it's got some things on the model, which are artifacts from Blender, like the sun here that we don't need. And another issue with these models is that the wheels are all one mesh. We're going to fix that with Pro Builder, but you could take it back into Blender and separate these wheels out. You can see that the rear wheels are just a little bit bigger than the front wheels. And in the package, there's actually multiple wheel types. And I kind of like this Wheels 5 model because it has some rims on it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Pro Builder to separate this mesh and have our tires be independent meshes. But you could do this in other ways. Dissecting meshes with ProBuilder can be tedious. If you prefer, I've left a Unity package at the root of the project repository that you can just import. It has the cart prefab with all the meshes, materials, and the wheel colliders set up. And I've converted the wheels in that package to OBJ format without the ProBuilder mesh. Regardless, for the next minute or so, I'll give a crash course in ProBuilder. Uh, basically, any mesh that you bring in, you want to be able to change in Unity using Pro Builder. You have to, first of all, open the Pro Builder tool from the Tools menu. And then once you've got the mesh selected, you can click Pro Builderize, and that will grab all the different vertices and faces and whatnot. And then once you've got it in there, like, for example, this wheel, I'm going to use the various tools. The blue ones are generally for selection and grab all the different faces of that mesh. And then I'm going to click detach faces and that will put it into its own model. Now this has a Pro Builder mesh filter on it. So typically you'll want to keep Pro Builder installed in your project just in case you want to make changes later, but also the wheel now has a Pro Builder script on it. So if you were to remove Pro Builder from your project, you'll get a warning about that. So I've got the wheels pulled apart here, and what I'm going to do is make each of them into a prefab so that we can easily use them later. A little bit off screen, I'm just going to reset the transforms of these, and then I'm going to delete them from the hierarchy. And then I'm going to start getting rid of the unnecessary parts of the body that we don't need. So on this model, we don't need the sun, we don't need the wheels anymore because we're going to put our own on. And I'm just going to reset its transform and then grab a couple more different colors of bodies and I'll put them in at the same position and do the same thing. Remove the sun and the wheels from them and that way the prefab will have several different body types that we can choose from later. And with all that done, we can now get to wheel physics. So I'm going to make an empty game object here that will hold all of our wheels. And below that, I'll make another empty and it's going to be our first wheel collider for our front right tire. And so I'm going to add a wheel collider to it. The nice thing about the Unity physics system for cars is that the default settings are all pretty good as long as your car is approximately the same size as a real world car. So because one unit in Unity is equivalent to one meter in the real world, as long as your car model is approximately three units long and one unit wide. So the only changes we're really going to have to make to each wheel collider is we're going to have to align its transform 
along with the axle where we want it to sit. And once we put the tire model on here, we'll change its radius to match. Just before I go any further, I'm going to come up to the parent cart object and I'm going to add a rigid body to it. Now the rigid body is required for the wheel colliders to all work properly. And the only setting that we really need to worry about here is changing the mass here to be about 1500. That'll keep the car pressing the wheels down to the ground. So with this wheel collider lined up, I'm going to change the radius. I already know that this front tire is about 1.1. And I'm going to grab that prefab that I made earlier and just drag it underneath. Now you'll notice it's sitting really strangely. And that's because I made it with Pro Builder and I forgot to reset its pivot point. So I'm just going to open the Pro Builder tools again here and I'll bring it up on screen so you can see what I'm talking about if in case you see this again. And once I've reset that, I need to reset the transform of this prefab as well. And there, now it's sitting nicely as it should. Now I'm just going to get a little closer look at the wheel collider itself here. If you notice the little wire sphere at the very bottom of the wheel collider, that's indicating where forces are going to be applied. Now you can tweak this value a little bit, but because we're making an arcade cart game, the default is just fine. All right, let's duplicate this. So the next wheel I will make just in the opposite position. I'm just going to change the X to be the negative of that. And if we go and have a look at it quickly, I'm just going to turn the meshes back on here and see it lined up all right. It's a little close to the front. I'm going to grab both of them and just pull them back just a little bit. Okay, let's duplicate one more wheel collider here and we'll use it for our first rear wheel. All right, and try and line it up a little bit, but as I mentioned earlier, the rear tires that came with the model are a little bit bigger, so pull that one in and that's going to require a little adjustment. So let's slide it out a bit and up a bit and we definitely have to change the radius. You can see it's too small, so let's make it, uh, let's see, that looks better. I think I'll settle on a 1.5 here and I'll just slide it up a little bit. And I'm just going to repeat it for the other side and all done. Well, now we can get started with input. And I'm going to start by dragging in the player input actions from our last project because it's almost exactly what we need. And all I have to do here is actually just remove two actions, the run and mouse control camera and rename jump to be break. And it's that simple. If you don't feel like doing this, grab this file from the repository and make sure you click Save, click Generate C-Sharp class, click Apply, and that's it. Now, if you don't want to use the actions from our last project for some reason, the next best thing to do is use the default ones that get installed because it's just way less work than trying to create everything from scratch. And as you know on this channel, don't repeat yourself. Applies not just to code, but into setting up your project or importing assets or anything like that. If you can avoid manual steps, by all means, do it. All right, so our input reader is going to inherit from scriptable object and implement the iPlayer actions interface. So I'm just going to use my context action to implement the interface. I'm going to replace all these exceptions with no op statements. We're not actually going to use them right now. I'm just going to clean this up a little bit. Then let's declare a variable to hold our input actions. Copilot already knows what I'm going to do here. So I'm just going to let it fill in on enable, assign a new player input actions into our input actions variable. Then we want to make sure we set the callbacks. Then I'm going to make a public method enable so that once the player is instantiated in the game, we can call this and enable the input actions for them. And then let's have two public properties. One is going to be the move vector, wherever the player is moving the cart. And the other one is going to be a Boolean is breaking just so long as that button is returning a positive value. That means the player is actually pressing the button. I'll just add a create asset menu attribute here so that we can come back into Unity and create an instance of this particular asset. So I'm just going to jump back into the editor really quickly and I'm going to go into the scriptable objects folder and I'll create one of those instances. And with that done, let's start working on the actual cart controller. So I'm going to jump back into Rider, define a new mono behavior called cart controller, move it into its own file. Let's start by defining a class called Axle Info. Now, this is very similar to what's in the Unity documentation, but I'm going to add two things here, and that is two wheel friction curves because we're going to adjust the friction for drifting, and I want to know what the settings were in the editor before we started the drift so we can go back to them later.
So these other properties here, we've got the wheel colliders for the left wheel and the right wheel and two booleans. Motor is going to be, are we going to apply torque to the wheels that are on this axle? And steering is, are these wheels allowed to turn? So in the cart controller, let's define some fields that we want to reference in the editor. First of all, our axle information. We got the front axle and the rear axle, so let's have an array for that. Next, we're going to have another section that's all about the motor attributes, such as torque. So the first thing should really be, what's the max torque we can apply to the motor? I'll give it a low default there. We're also going to, at some point here, decide what the max speed is of the vehicle. Next, steering attributes. How much do we want the wheels to actually turn? Let's start with 30 degrees and we'll go from there. Next, we need a reference to our input reader that we just defined. And we're going to need to reference our rigid body for lots of different reasons, so let's cache it into a variable here. Now we can write our start method. So we can grab a reference to our rigid body right away, and we're gonna to wanna to enable our input actions with that public method that we made. And then let's get those values for the wheel friction curve, and we'll store them into the class. I'm gonna collapse up start, and we'll start working on the bulk of this controller, which is all gonna happen in fixed update. First of all, let's cache the values from our input move, because we're gonna reference them several times. Let's set a value for how much torque we're going to apply to the wheel. So we're just going to take the vertical input, which is a value between 0 and 1, and apply it to the max motor torque. And then we're going to do the same thing for steering. Now, one problem that we're going to face with keyboard inputs is that if a player was pressing forward and sideways at the same time, the values returned are always going to be about 0.71 for both of them. On a gamepad, you're always going to get an accurate representation of where the stick is at. What I'm going to do is create a little helper method here. If the input crosses a certain threshold, which I'll say is 0.7 in either direction, we'll just normalize the value right up to plus one or negative one. So it'll be the same gameplay experience, whether you're on a gamepad or a keyboard. Then we'll just come up and add this adjust input method to apply when we're setting our vertical input and horizontal input. Okay, now we know how much torque to apply to the wheels and how much steering to apply, let's make a method that will update our axles. So we'll pass those values in. In our new method, we're going to iterate over the axles. So for each axle info, we are going to either apply steering or motor or possibly both. We'll segregate that into their own little methods just for ease of reading and understanding. So we'll make a method handle steering, which will pass in that axle info and the steering value. Same thing for handle motor. And then we're going to make another method called handle brakes and drift. And finally, for all car controllers that use the Unity physics system, you have to turn the wheels yourself. So we'll make a method that will update the visuals for each wheel. So all of these little methods are very straightforward. Handle steering. If the Boolean steering is true, let's apply that steering to the steer angle of those wheels. And Copilot already knows what to do for the most part here. Handle motor is almost the same, just applying the motor value to the motor torque. We're going to add drifting in at the very end of this video. So for now, what we need to do is freeze rotation when we're starting to brake because we don't want the car going crazy and flipping around. One technique that you can do is just freeze the constraints on the rigid body. Copilot's making a suggestion here to freeze it on X and Z, but I think it's okay to leave it on Z because I don't mind if the car rotates a little bit forward or backwards when it's braking, and that's fine. What we'll do is let's set a new Z value that is just going to be a damp of what our current velocity is down to zero. And I'm just going to put a hard-coded one second time in there, and then we're going to apply that to our rigid body velocity with a new Z value. Now that with extension method is something we made in a previous video. It's in the code repository and we're going to look at it a little closer later in the video. So now we're slowing our rigid body down. Let's apply some brake torque as well to our wheels. If we're not braking, we want to set the brake torque back to zero and release all the constraints. Now we've got a few new fields we need to define. Let's come back up here to the top of the class. Let's make a new section for braking and drifting and let's set our brake torque very high. And let's just make another field to hold that velocity value. Almost done. Let's update our visuals. We gotta make the tires spin. So let's get a new method here and we're gonna take in the wheel collider. Let's just make sure that there actually is a visual 
under there some kind of child if there isn't just bail out but if there is let's get that visual and i'm just going to scroll up here we're going to use the wheel collider method get world pose that'll get us the position and rotation of the wheel collider and we can just apply that to the visual and that's really all there is to it back in unity let's add our cart controller to our cart and we'll add two axle infos and I'm just gonna drag every wheel in here as it belongs. And I'm going to set it to be rear wheel drive and front steering. I'm gonna set a default value for max speed and drag in our input reader reference. And I'm gonna add a box collider to the cart itself. I'm just gonna stretch the collider out to be about as big as the cart. Now, if I come back over to the ground plane, I'm going to get rid of the mesh collider on here. I'm just going to delete it and then add a very thin box collider to it. Next, let's just import the most basic virtual camera from Cinemachine. In its settings, we'll make it follow the cart around. So we can drag our cart into the follow and the look at fields. And I'm going to expand body here and let's just raise it up above the cart and further behind. And let's take a look at the main camera here and you can see what it's kind of going to look like. Yeah, let's press play and have a look. Okay, well, it definitely drives around, but it's hard to tell if it's doing anything because there's no scenery. So what I'm going to do is I have an asset pack from Cinti, which is their mobile racing kit. And inside of it is a pre-built track. And so I've made it a little bit bigger for the purpose of this and a prefab out of it that I've just dragged into here. I'll put a link to this in the description as well if you're interested in this. This will be enough for us to tell how the cart's performing so far. I'm going to press play and let's see how our basic cart controller performs. So you can turn left and right. Uh, you know, it definitely moves. It's moving very slowly though. One thing we can do here is crank up the motor torque. If you were running just a very basic cart and not going to do anything extra, you would probably keep this number closer to 30,000 or 50,000 maybe. So if I turn it up here to 30,000, it's definitely starting to accelerate, but very slowly. Now, this is a very simple controller so far. So what we need to do is jazz it up so it feels really good. And that's what we're going to do next here. Before we start doing any customizations, I just want to have this up on the screen so we have a good idea of what's about to happen. If we ever become airborne, I just want to do one thing, and that is apply gravity to the car to bring it back down to the ground. I want to apply four different customizations when we're on the ground. Improve turning. I want the car to turn faster and give it a more of an arcade kind of feel to it. I also want to be able to accelerate much faster than the car is doing all by itself. I want to constantly apply a downforce to the car when it's on the ground, and that's going to help us stay on the ground when we're coming around corners and when we're drifting fast. And the last thing I want to do is shift the center of mass. If we're doing a donut, for example, or where the cart is coming into a forward turn, I want to shift the center of mass backwards in the car so that the back end of the car doesn't suddenly come off the ground because we're applying so much torque to it. And the opposite is true. If we go into reverse and start doing major turns, I also want to shift the center of mass. And these last two things in particular, the downforce and changing the center of mass, are going to keep our car on the ground when we're doing rapid maneuvers, spinning around and drifting. Okay, let's define a few new fields that'll support these customizations. Under steering, let's have an animation curve. So we're going to allow the player to turn a little more sharply at slower accelerations. And then we're going to have a multiplier here called turn strength. Under braking and drifting, we're also going to have a steering multiplier. And that's because in case if we were drifting, I want the player to be able to turn even tighter. Now we need a few more fields that will just represent the other things, the other concepts. So we'll have an empty transform just for center of mass that we're going to shift around. And we're going to have the downforce gravity. We can just grab physics gravity dot y. Let's also store a value here for the lateral G scale. Now we'll look at this in detail in a minute when we implement the downforce. But when the car is sliding to the side, we're going to be able to tell what the force is by calculating the dot product. And we'll look at that in a minute. Let's put all this under a header just called physics. And I'm going to add a few more fields for banking because we can lean the car a little bit when we're in a turn. And make it look and feel a little bit more fun. 
Not very high values though. Like we don't want the cart to look like it's going to tip right over or actually tip it. I'll add one more header here for refs, which at the moment is just our input reader. I'm going to declare a couple more fields here that we're going to use as we're damping and lerping values. And we're going to do one raycast, so I'll put something here for that. I need a couple constants that I know I need already. I'm just going to define them and we'll talk about them in a moment. We're going to have one more field here to track our original center of mass. And that'll be whatever the game starts at. When this cart is instantiated in the game, we'll store that value. When we come out of a drift or we're not, we want to reset the center of mass back to its original, we can do that. And that way you can adjust it a little bit in the editor if you want. I'm going to make a couple public properties that we're going to need later when we're trying to implement our skid marks and we need when, our audio, of course. We'll need references to all of those things. Now in our start method, we can store, well, first let's set the center of, of mass to be what we defined in the editor. Let's also cache that reference so that we can get it later. Down in our fixed update method, we're going to have an update banking method that's going to be very simple. And then we'll grab our actual cart velocity before we do anything else. If we're grounded, we're going to handle the grounded movement. If we're not grounded, we're going to handle airborne movement and we'll keep all the logic for our customizations in those two methods. So let's start with handle airborne movement because it's the simplest. All we're going to do is lerp a value from our current velocity to an adjusted velocity where we're applying gravity based on time dot delta time. So we'll just add a vector three dot down multiplied by our gravity value and yeah, that's really it. Maybe I'll just add a little comment here. Now, update banking is the next simplest method to implement. So all we're sending in there is our horizontal input. Is the player in some kind of turn? Let's bank it in the opposite direction. We'll just pick a target bank angle to go for, grab its current angle, and we'll bank from our current Z angle towards the target based on our bank speed and time dot delta time, set the angle, that's it. Okay, now for our four custom implementations we wanna do for improving our grounded movement. If there's any vertical input or the cart is actually moving in a forward direction or along its Z axis, let's calculate a multiplier by evaluating the curve that we're gonna set, the animation curve. And that'll just be what uh, the magnitude of our velocity divided by our max speed. Once we have that value, we can apply a, a torque to our rigid body. We're gonna rotate the vector around vector three up, multiply by whatever our horizontal input is. So let's get the sign uh, are we moving forward or backwards and multiply by the turn strength we just calculated times 100 multiplied by our turn multiplier. Okay, that kind of feels like a complicated little expression, but all it's really doing is evaluating a point on our curve that we're going to define based on how fast we're moving. And that's how we decide how much torque we're going to apply to our steering. Acceleration is much simpler. As long as we're not braking, Let's set our target speed to be whatever our input is multiplied by max speed. Now here I'm using our width extension method again. Let's jump over to that class and just bring it up on the screen quickly. So width will set an X, Y, or Z value to whatever you pass in. The add method is similar, but it will simply add or subtract from the same values. So it's a shorthand way of not having to say new vector here and uh, it just makes it less verbose. That'll be in the repository as well. So now that we have that, what we want to do is set our rigid body's velocity and alert value from what we have now to that target speed multiplied by that vector. Okay, downforce, always going to push the car down. So the idea here is going to be to figure out a speed factor if we're moving at a fairly decent velocity ahead or backwards. And also we want to know What's the lateral g-force as we're moving side to side? So if we're in a drift or a really tight turn, let's get the dot product of the rigid body's velocity with the transform right. Now, 
one of these values is going to be bigger than the other at any given time. So I'm going to scale down the lateral G. That's what that lateral G scale setting was for. And whichever one of those is bigger is going to be the downforce factor. And we're going to add that force every fixed update to push the cart downwards. So when, the, when we're drifting sideways, the lateral G will be higher and we'll get even more downforce on the car at that time. Now you don't want to have too much downforce on the car all the time because it'll make it bump up and down and the physics simulation will look kind of weird. So that's a value you might have to tweak, but the settings that I'm going to use in the inspector are pretty good. Now let's get to shifting the center of mass back and forth. We want to know the magnitude of our velocity and we'll just call that speed. And we're going to adjust that either backwards or forwards based on where we're moving, how we're moving, you know, are we driving ahead or backwards? So we can use math absolute of our vertical input. And as long as that's greater than, let's say 0.1, then we can simply set our Z value to whatever that sign is times the offset value, you know, and if it's, if we're not moving at all, it's just going to be zero. And then we're going to set our rigid body center of mass to whatever the original was, plus this adjustment. Okay, back in Unity, we've got two things to do. I'm going to have a new game object here under our cart called center of mass. And we need to drag that transform in to our cart. And then we're going to define our turn animation curve. And I'm going to just take this one for now. Let's see how it performs like this. So I'm getting rapid, rapid turns at not very high speeds, but the cart is definitely jumpy. You can see it's bouncing a little bit on turns. And the reason for that is because we're not quite done implementing the drift, which will actually lock up the wheels and change the friction. So yeah, you can also tell there's no colliders in the environment yet, just running right through all the barriers. We'll fix that in the future. Couple things to adjust and just a tiny bit of code to still write to change that friction up. Looks pretty good though. <laughs> it sure turns fast. Okay. So we've got basically two methods to write here and maybe one little helper. We're going to apply drift friction when we're braking. And when we're not braking, we're going to reset our friction back to whatever it was before. So we need two methods that'll handle that. Let's start with applying the drift friction. So what we'll do is we'll use the get ground hit method of the wheel collider. And as long as we're touching the ground, let's set the forward friction equal to, and let's make a helper method here. The update friction will take in the wheel friction curve and we're going to change the stiffness. So if we're braking, we're going to damp the stiffness all the way to 0.5 from whatever it was before. Otherwise, it's going to 1. And then we'll just return that. And so up in our applied drift friction, we can do that with the sideways friction too. And because we know we've hit the ground, we can set our is grounded variable here as well. For resetting the drift friction, this is a little bit simpler. Let's again, let's pass in our wheel collider. Now I'm just going to put in a little link statement. All I care about is grabbing whichever wheel I can get first out of that glass. And, you know, supposing there is one. If there isn't, we bail out. If there is, we're going to set our friction back to the original friction values. And that's it. We are code complete. Before we do any more playtesting though, I want this turning curve to be slightly inverted because I want it to be harder to turn at lower speeds and slightly easier to turn when we're going faster. Now I've added a little trail renderer that's going to put down some skid marks and this will be in the repository. I'm not going to go over it today though because we're going to throw it out next episode and put in something much better. But I just wanted to have it here so that we can see whenever the tire slips, it's going to lay down this little trail. So it'll help us visualize that the drift is working and that the cart is behaving the way that we think it's supposed to be. <laughs> it's bouncing a little bit. Might need to adjust the downforce. <laughs> 
So this is where we're going to stop today. Next episode, we're going to improve the skid marks, like I mentioned, and quite a few other things. But congratulations, we now have a working cart controller that we can use going forward with this project. Building a cart controller is very tricky and finicky, and you might experience some problems. All the code's going to be in the repository, so feel free to use that as a reference. Uh, you can actually clone the entire repository if you feel like it, but it doesn't have any of the paid models. But it will have this prefab for the cart. I'm also going to put some images up on the screen here and links to all of these free resources are going to be in the description. There's also a universal sound effects pack that's on sale for 50% off right now that has a lot of car sounds in it. If you're interested in that, it has a lot of other sounds too. There's all kinds of explosions and more sound effects than I even know what to do with. Anyway, that's going to be a wrap for today. Believe it or not, building a fun cart controller that can drift like this may be the hardest part of this entire series. We'll see. Challenges remain. Lots to do yet on our journey towards building a multiplayer game with some other extra features. We're going to get into them one by one in each episode of this series. So make sure you like the video, subscribe if you haven't, and I'll see you in the comments below.